During your time playing Nikkei, you may have noticed these two buttons on the top left. You can play the game in auto mode or manual mode. You may have also noticed that you can switch units at any time and also order everyone to go into cover. But how do these gameplay mechanics work exactly? And how do they impact the way you play? My name is Psyche, and in this volume on my detailed series of guides called Commander Bootcamp, I'm going to be exploring past the team building phase, and explain everything you will need to know as a beginner slash intermediate about how to play Nikkei on a moment to moment basis, as well as the many nuances of gameplay mechanics including auto versus manual mode, when to switch units or take cover, as well as some unit's passive abilities that only start to shine when you play manually. Strap in, as there's a lot to cover, and let's jump into the battlefield. Now, Nikkei at its core is an idle game. They advertise it that you can play it with one hand, but putting it in auto mode technically means you can play it with no hands, if you know what I mean. I know in the early parts of the game, you don't really have to worry about min-maxing damage or thinking too much about playing your teams in battle. But setting up your teams in a certain way does impact the way the game plays itself for you. Before I go any further, I'm going to be using terms that I covered in the last volume of Commander Bootcamp. So be sure to watch that, where you might get confused about what I say. Well, let's start this guy by going over what auto mode actually does. First off, go into your settings and turn off change Nikkei's automatically during auto combat. I don't know why this exists, since the game is taking the wheel anyways. Which Nikkei is active is pretty irrelevant, and it will just confuse the hell out of you. There are two toggles in the top left corner. The left one is auto aim, so you don't have to aim any weapons yourself. The on-field unit will automatically aim for enemies themselves. This isn't what you want sometimes, since you want to prioritize certain enemies over others, like killing the boss that just wins you the level if you beat it. However, there are times where auto-aim is actually quite useful, like hitting the core slash weak spot of a certain enemy that's really hard to manually aim yourself. Even if the auto-aim is turned on, you can still use your cursor to take over if you want. A major caveat is that putting units in auto-aim will always make them fire their weapon as long as there's an enemy on the field. Sometimes, when your magazine is half empty and you want to reload it, instead of going into cover and reloading, the unit will just peek out and interrupt the reload process. This means playing on auto will always cause your units to fully empty their magazine before they reload it, assuming the situation allows it. Playing on manual will make you more in control of the unit, being able to go into cover on demand, reload whenever you want, and prioritize certain enemies. However, if you're just running a low difficulty challenge, like in event stories, then there's usually no need to go manual, since your power level is so high, it's basically a free win. The second tab toggles automatic use of burst skills. This actually gets deeper than you may think. When you configure your units in the five empty slots, the order that you place them actually matters. At least if you use this auto mechanic. When the game picks which unit's burst skill to use, it will always pick the leftmost unit's burst of a particular type. If the leftmost unit is not available, like if they're stunned, knocked out of commission, or still in cooldown, the game will pick the next unit in line instead. Ordering your units in the party matters when you want the game to automatically pick the order to activate certain burst skills in a particular type. For example, if I put Leader plus Senti, and three Type 3s, Moldernia, Scarlet, and Helm, the game will pick Leader since she is the only Type 1 in the team, Senti because she's the only Type 2 in the team, and then Moldernia because she is the leftmost unit of the three Type 3s in the team. On the second burst rotation, the game will pick Leader, Senti, then Scarlet because Moldernia's burst is still in cooldown, so it will pick the next Nikkei in line. It does not matter if you place Leader or Senti in the middle or right side of the party, since you have to activate the types in order. In this team, I'm running two Type 1s, Noise and Leader. If I put it on Auto, the game will pick Noise because she is the leftmost Type 1 unit. Then Guilty since she's the only Type 2, then Moldernia. On the second rotation, the game will pick Leader since Noise's burst is in cooldown, then Guilty, then Scarlet since Moldernia's burst is in cooldown. So overall, while there is some nuance in auto burst skills, it's useful for levels that you know you can beat and have a good idea of how the level is gonna go. But for the majority of the late game, I would personally turn this off, as you definitely want to choose which unit to burst as things can change a lot during a battle. When picking bursts manually, there can be a lot of factors that can go into when you use the skill and which one you use. For example, in this chatterbox fight, I activate leader and senti skills quickly to get the buffs going, but I intentionally wait a little before Moldernia's burst, since I'm waiting for the boss to do a specific attack so that Moldernia's burst can counter it. 
In this blacksmith fight, I do the same, but I wait until the boss shoots out missiles before using Scarlet's Burst, since she deals screen-wide damage to everything, and if I used it earlier, then I can't wipe the missiles when they're launched. These are some examples where playing in manual can have advantages when it comes to which burst skill to use. There's way too many situations where this matters, but what I just listed here were just some of the few that I encounter regularly. Now let's go over weapon types. During the first volume of the bootcamp, I mentioned that you needed to know whether weapon types exist, but you don't need to know the intricate details. Well, let's dig deeper and find out how different weapon types can matter. Currently, there are six weapon types in the game. If we review the effective range of them, we can see that submachine guns and shotguns have low range. This is because they suffer from low accuracy. I personally don't know any good DPS units that use submachine guns. It seems to be a trend among support units, so it's safe to assume that most SMG users are not expected to do much damage. The mid-range section is covered by assault rifle and minigun users. These are generalist options that perform well almost in any scenario, and sniper rifle users cover the long range. They're especially good for aiming for those enemy cores that are far away. Rocket launcher users aren't listed here, but they don't have any range restrictions and are good when dealing AoE damage since they cause explosions. Shotgun and rocket launcher users typically have high burst generation, meaning they can fill up your burst gauge faster since they're technically hitting more enemies all at once with their pallets or explosions. Sniper rifle and rocket launcher users can charge up their attacks, and there are separate damage multipliers that only apply to them like charge speed and charge damage. If you put the game on auto, these units will always charge up their attack to 100% before firing, but you can technically fire them before filling up at the cost of lower damage. Shotguns and rocket launcher users also reload their weapons in a unique way. Just like loading shells or rockets into the chamber, they will reload their weapons at certain increments at a time. If you put the game in autoplay, they will always empty their magazine and refill it completely. But in manual mode, you can load one increment at a time, then immediately fire it. Note that not all of them do this, some units will reload everything all at once. So when should you switch characters? Since everyone seems to be doing their own things pretty well, what difference does it make if I on-field one unit for the entirety of a level? So, there are many abilities in the game where it's way more efficient if you play it manually. For example, Dorothy's Burst will allow you to select a specific enemy that gets debuffed. You probably want this to be on the boss or an elite enemy, but playing the game on auto might just cause Dorothy to pick a random small fry enemy to place debuff on instead. Some abilities, like Drake or Rupee, will allow you to select an AoE on the battlefield to do damage. You will probably choose a location that has a lot of enemies within it to maximize the output. Some burst abilities in the game will change the way that a particular unit is played temporarily. For example, Alice's burst will cause her to have increased charge speed, so manually controlling Alice while aiming for an enemy weak spot is an amazing way to maximize DPS. Some units like Maxwell and Snow White will actually change the weapon they're using. Upon use of the burst skill, Maxwell will charge up a high damaging laser beam that pierces everything in its path. In this boss fight here, I activate Maxwell's burst, then switch to her to charge it up and aim specifically for an enemy weak spot. These are some examples of how different units' burst skills can be utilized to the fullest if played manually. But there are also some examples when the benefits of manual play may not be so apparent. Take a look at this footage of a campaign level. Watch closely to my burst gauge on the side as I switch to Senti. As you can see, in literally a second, the gauge miraculously fills completely, and I get to enter full burst right away. But why did this happen? Well, remember when I said that rocket launcher and shotgun users have high burst generation? Well, Senti at the time of this video's release boasts having the highest burst generation in the game. In this example, I switch to Senti, then intentionally fire quick, low-damaging missiles at a cluster of enemies. I didn't intend to do damage, but I did want to fill up the burst gauge. So again, there are many nuances to playing manually. Some are apparent, some not so apparent. You've probably noticed the cover mechanic by now. By tapping your on-field unit's portrait or by pressing spacebar on PC, you can order everyone to take cover. You can achieve the same thing on manual mode for a specific unit if you just don't aim your weapon. If a unit is in cover, any damage dealt to them will typically be dealt to their cover health instead, the blue meter on top of their health. So when should you use this mechanic? Typically, it only matters during boss fights when you know they're about to do a specific attack to protect your units. 
For example, in the Modernia fight, she will unleash a wide laser beam that targets everyone. By going into cover, you can negate the first time she does this. But if you don't, your entire team gets stunned and the level is basically over. This definitely gets more importance as you progress into the late game, as some attacks are better off blocked instead of trying to tank it. One last thing I want to talk about is various passive abilities that may come into play when controlling manually. One of the most relevant mechanics is an effect that triggers whenever a unit empties their magazine. Now you might think that it's not really a big deal since if you play on auto, a unit will always empty their magazine anyways. But this is not always the case. Let's take a look at Pepper, a type 1 healer that will heal the ally with the lowest health when the last shot in the magazine hits an enemy. If you put her on auto, she will empty the magazine, then refill the whole thing. But if you play manually, you can activate this passive more frequently since she is one of the shotgun users that reload in increments. So you can use this ability once every 3 shots since she reloads 3 shells at a time for a total magazine size of 9. But let's do one step better. If we combine Pepper with Pervati, who has a passive that cuts everyone's mag size in half but decreases reload time, because of how rounding works, this will actually make it so that Pepper will only reload one shell at a time. Meaning you can abuse the hell out of this and heal someone every time you fire Pepper's gun. In fact, they probably realized how much of a mistake this was, because most shotgun users released today will reload everything all at once. Another example of activating passives is Pravati herself. She has a skill where she deals a lot of damage to a stunned enemy when the last bullet of her magazine hits it. This is a very, very specific requirement that usually can't be met, but let's try being crafty for a moment. Because Pravati's burst will stun all enemies for 3 seconds, what we can do is manually emptying out Pravati's mag, then when she has around 10 to 20 rounds left, we go into full burst with her skill. Because we have a low bullet count left in the mag, we can empty it within the 3 seconds of stun. And boom, massive damage. These are just some examples where passive abilities are better used, or abused, when you play the game manually. Okay, I know that was a lot to cover, but hopefully I was able to provide some information as well as some examples of how auto versus manual play can differ and the many intricate details of this game when you really get into it. All I can say is, this game is more than just a one-handed shooter. There are still some hidden mechanics I haven't covered, like iframing, damage to parts, advanced team synergies, snapshotting, but I'll save those for another day. Next time, we will be taking a closer look at Harmony Cubes and the effects they have on your units. As always, if you enjoy this guide and would like to see more Nikkei content, you know what to do. Thanks for watching, and always remember, have fun with the game.